Uh, in this panel, we aim to get into the details of what's driving uh, the, that, that set of activity that Matt was, uh, was, was speaking to us about. So globally, as we've heard, government and private stakeholders are describing and implementing visions and plans for a sustained presence on the moon, a presence that would require multiple users, uses, and activities to interact in a manner that is sustainable. But at the same time, it's hard for us to talk about the future of lunar space activities, the future of cislunar space activities, without making comparisons to the original space race. And in some cases, that's a deliberate strategy to recreate that excitement, that tension, and the budgets, yes, the budgets, uh, of the 1960s Cold War. There are good reasons to expand into cislunar space and return to the moon, but there's also a lot of challenges and unknowns. So in our next hour discussion, let's ask, realistically, how did the drivers and opportunities in cislunar space align or not align with how that activity is being described. Brief reminder, HOOVA exists, questions, we're gonna to get to them in this panel. Please submit those questions through, uh, through uh, the HOOVA app. Bios for our speakers are also there in that app, so just very briefly gonna go and introduce our speakers so we can get right into the discussion. Uh, to my immediate left, Caitlin Johnson is the Deputy Director and Fellow of the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, often better known as CSIS. Uh, Caitlin was the author of the CS CSIS report, Fly Me to the Moon, Worldwide Cislunar and Lunar Missions, which examines planned missions over the next decade from countries around the world. Uh, to Caitlin's left, Matthias Link is uh, the director and a member of the executive committee <coughs> at the Luxembourg Space Agency, where he works on the definition and implementation of Luxembourg's space sector development policy and also coordinates the spaceresources.lu initiative. Uh, to uh, Matthias's left is uh, Richard Lowe, who is the Director of Technical Services at the United Kingdom Satellite Applications Catapult, where he serves as, and also serves as co-chair of the UK Space Industries Trade Association Working Group for In-Orbit Service and Manufacture. To Richard's left, uh, Asif Siddiqui is a Professor of History at Fordham University here in New York, where he specializes in the history of science and technology, and has written extensively on the history of space exploration. <coughs> Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right into our discussion here. Um, Caitlin, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, so Matt just outlined a, a very busy cislunar uh, space environment or, or space uh, activities in the, in the coming decade. I think you referenced somewhere between 100 to 150 missions, depending on, uh, on how you count. Um, you've been researching these missions. Um, so from that research, what can you tell us about the expected tempo, timing of these lunar missions, and behind, beyond the traditional space powers, who's getting involved? Sure. Well, thank you to Secure World for inviting me today. I'm delighted to be here and to talk about cislunar space. It's not um, often that we put a lot of substance behind this conversation. Instead, we hear um, references to the space race on headlines, and so I'm, I'm excited to dive deeper into the actual motivators and drivers of going back to the moon. Um, I did do a, a research project that looked at what that uh, environment will look like in the next 10 years. And yes, I came out with like 106, so somewhere within Matt's range. And I'm sure I missed some because it is incredible the amount of new companies um, and new nations as well um, getting involved uh, in cislunar space. So it's not just from uh, the Artemis uh, program from NASA or from the lunar program driven by Russia or China, but really we're seeing a global effort. and uniquely, I think, a commercial effort. Um, this is going to really change the way that we think about setting good rules behavior and norms, standards of operation, uh, when commercial companies may be the first to return to the moon before a government. Um, and so it really can impact how we approach this problem early and often. And I think General Shaw really hit it on the head this morning of we know what we did wrong in near Earth space and we can do better in cislunar space. Um, so there is this huge push in the next decade to send dozens of missions. Now, space is hard, rocket science is hard, we all know this, so a lot of those timelines may shift, um, but I really do anticipate uh, us seeing a lot of activity in the next five to 10 years, um, and it's creating ripple effects. And, and Papers like uh, the OSTP one um, have really incentivized, I think, the, the US, but also our allies and partners and other uh, nations who are interested in being a part of this movement to start 
talking about these issues and, and thinking out ahead on how do we make sure that cislunar space and the moon are more sustainable than our near Earth orbits. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, so, Matthias, uh, coming, to, coming to you. So, where does Luxembourg fit here? You've joined the Artemis program. You have a policy focus on space resources development. Uh, policy, general motivations and policy interests for Luxembourg in returning to the moon. Yeah, thank you very much, Ian. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here and for this great event. It's uh, amazing the quality that you, you were able to put together in terms of the agenda. And it's also very interesting to see how broad the topic of sustainability actually is. So it's, it's really, it has many different aspects to be considered and including what we are discussing now on, on the moon. Now for the role of Luxembourg, I have to just maybe recall where we come from. Luxembourg has been active in space since several decades. Uh, we started in the 1980s with the creation of the company SES that you heard of from yesterday in particular. And so we started uh, with a policy in general that was very much oriented towards commercial space. That's what we know. Uh, that's how, how we approach space. So, uh, and it's also, also absolutely key for us in terms of the national strategy to, to build our ecosystem in space, to develop the space sector, and especially the commercial space sector. And indeed, we launched in, in 2016 uh, the Space Resources.lu initiative with the intention to promote the peaceful exploration and sustainable utilization of space resources for the benefit of humankind. And that's, why, that's because we think that this will be the next big thing in, in the cis lunar economy and beyond. It's really using the resources, of course, for exploration. It's very much related to that, uh, to the agency plans, but it's much more than that. It's really uh, one of the foundations to create a, a true in-space economy. And of course, there are still many, many challenges ahead of us. It's also more long-term, even though sometimes you get a feeling of a race uh, that, uh, that we have to be very quick, but we, I think we all know in terms of space resources at least that this will still take, take some time. And of course you have to, to, to solve the challenges around technology, technology development, demonstration of these technologies in space. You have a huge challenge around legal and regulatory issues, and COPUOS was mentioned several times. I was there last week. I can tell you it can be very frustrating, but in the end it's, it's progressing. Um, there's the financial challenge. We're speaking about uh, um, commercial companies, so we need also investors. We need to find these investors and we need to reinsure them that there is something that they can invest their money here. And of course, there's the business challenge. So we, we talk about different, um, we see these markets coming up in, in maybe 10, 20, maybe even more years. But how do you actually create these markets? So there's also a role for governments and space agencies to, to help there. And so at the Luxembourg Space Agency, we've been doing this now for, yeah, what, seven years in, in, in very much detail, even more if I uh, see, see the preparative work that went into it. And we've, we have a whole strategy basically addressing all these challenges in parallel because, of course, they are very much interrelated. And uh, there is a lot of movement here in, in all these different uh, challenges that can, that can be solved and, uh, and where we see a, a progress uh, going forward. So. Yeah, thank you, so the Feeling of a race, but in a long-term uh, development pathway is an interesting yes. dynamic. And of course, we can come back to the, the, yeah. this metaphor of, of yeah. using a race. Uh, it's definitely not a race, uh, we think, with just one winner. <laughs> there are several winners. There are opportunities for a lot of, uh, of um, of entities, both private and public, mm -hmm. and and of course we hope that this is going to be done in a in a in a very inclusive and international um, way, so that there are w many winners in the end. So. Yeah. All right, so uh, Richard, I'm going to turn to you with a, a somewhat similar question, but uh, so the UK, your uh, the country you're from, is also an <laughs> Artemis program participant, but I don't think of the UK as having a history, a deep history of involvement in, in, in lunar activities. Uh, from the perspective of the satellite applications catapult. Uh, in your mission to increase the utilization of space, space technology. Uh, what is the opportunity for the UK in participating in lunar activities? Thanks, Ian. So yeah, I'm privileged to be here. And I, I think um, in particular a, a privilege, I think, to be amongst such uh, a community of like-minded people. I think that's what struck me particularly over the last few days, that uh, everybody is coming at the sustainability angle uh, in such a unified way. From 
the perspective of the, uh, the UK and the satellite applications catapult that I represent, um, uh, just, just particularly from the, the, the catapult organisation's um, direction. Our, um, our remit, the way we express what it is that we're here to do, uh, is, is as innovating for a better world empowered by space. And, and that's why we're one of the sponsors for, for this event, um, that, that sort of better world uh, aspect. And, um, and it's also why I think we, we see the UK as having a, a, a substantial future in, uh, in lunar exploration. It's, um, I, I think for all participants in lunar exploration, it, it's about science, it's about technology, inspiration, uh, you know, opportunities, and so on. Um, many of the themes that we, we heard about earlier uh, in the presentation are exactly aligned to where the UK uh, sees its own um, opportunities. So we're already working uh, into lunar communication systems. Uh, we're already working into uh, navigation capability in, in cis lunar space. Um, we're already working into uh, science and, and remote sensing and so on. You know, these are all the things that every participant in, uh, in lunar exploration uh, hopes to, to get uh, out of the exercise. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have, uh, you know, we haven't had our own lunar program in the past, uh, but absolutely the UK was involved or, and had uh, engagement in, uh, in the original Apollo uh, exercises. Um, indeed, some of the data from the Apollo landings um, landed back on Earth um, in ground stations located in, in the UK. And that legacy has, has gone on for a long time since then. Uh, we, people, uh, Brits, came back from uh, the Apollo missions. Um, they brought with them understanding gained. Uh, they became the, the, the core of, of the emerging space sector in the UK. Um, and I, I think we see the same uh, exercise here. Uh, all those same opportunities for gain will, uh, will come about. If there's opportunity for anyone in cislunar exploration, uh, then there's opportunity for the UK and everyone. So we do have a legacy of lunar activities from, from prior, act, you know, prior activities, bad English, but we've done this, we've been to the moon, we've, we've taken that experience and built it into you know, how we um, approach the space sector today and now we're looking for new opportunities and growing that. Okay, so Asif, um, coming, coming to you from a, uh, maybe a historical perspective here, right? So reflecting both on the title of this panel, it's still not a lunar space race, and the activities we're already starting to describe here, uh, we definitely have a tendency to refer back to that as, uh, Apollo space race uh, that, that we know um, and make those analogies uh, to today. Uh, from your perspective as one of the foremost historians on the Apollo era, was this actually a race? Uh, do we have the, myth the mythology right? And, and what's the reality of what happened then versus the, the narrative that we hear? Right, well, to, first of all, thank you, Ian, um, and it's great to be here uh, for so many reasons. Um, just to quickly get to your question, um, I think if you, uh, two points really, one, as a kind of historically bounded set of events between, let's say, Sputnik and the landing of uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon in 1969, yes, there's a, we can think of it as a race between two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. But I do want to make two points. One is, the first is that the space, human exploration of space, not human space flight, but actually launching satellites began in 1957 during a time of the International Geophysical Year, which was considered a kind of global cooperative space project. But yet it quickly devolved into a very high stakes race uh, very soon by the 1960s. So uh, a global collaboration doesn't necessarily ensure any kind of, uh, that, the, the continuity of that, those sorts of initiatives really have to work uh, a lot of different ways. But secondly, we forget that prior to landing in 1969, there's an enormous amount of investment in robotic exploration of the moon, uh, both by the Soviets and the United States, um, in terms of all sorts of smaller benchmarks, like the first uh, lunar impact, first pictures of the far side, a first lunar landing, a soft landing, first lunar uh, orbit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can go down the list. And it's, it, we forget, but in those little races, which were, there were many, the Soviet Union was really predominant and dominated almost every single benchmark. But it's forgotten because the big one was won by the United States. So I think one of the, th one of the things that I draw from that experience is that, th and thinking about now, it seems to me there are a lot of little races going on. Um, I do think that, you know, for, for better or for worse, that's how we think about it, whether we, we publicly acknowledge it or not. 
there are a lot of little races going on, but I, th I do think there's a, there's a couple of big milestones perhaps coming up that when I think of Apollo, that might be sort of compar comparatively important. One is, of course, uh, the return of humans to the moon uh, whenever that happens in the near future, but the other one is the establishment of permanent human presence on the moon whenever that is, and I think those those are the really sort of big benchmarks, but there are a lot of little races, and just like in the 1960s. Um, but I do, again, as a historian, I have to draw, offer a caveat. There are similarities, but there are enormous differences, which I can also get into later, which, because, uh, you know, as historians, we are very loath to make those comparisons. We offer like 10 caveats, usually, about everything <laughs> we say. I don't have time for the caveats, but I'll offer the generalizations right now. Yeah. So, so. There is a dynamic of competition, but it may be in smaller, more discrete chunks and different relationships than, than one yeah. big, big and interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Interesting. All right. Okay, so let's try and get a little bit deeper into some of the things that, that we've already raised here. And, and, and Caitlin, I'm going to circle back to the, the research that you've been doing. Um, the drivers, economic, business, programmatic, behind the missions that, that, that you're assessing in, in the research. Um, how do they compare to that, that discussion of geopolitical competition, resource competition, human off Earth planet expansion? Are the drivers that we see in the discourse, are they the drivers that you're seeing in the, in the reality of missions? I think the drivers are, are varied across governments, across industry, um, and there are, there are many of them. So I jotted down several, and they're in no particular order, but I would love to see how, these, how I've found these drivers maybe compare with the, the drivers from the first uh, space race. And that's, of course, the potential for resources, which has spurred a lot of action. Um, economically, I think it's a bit unclear of, of how that might impact Earth, uh, bringing resources back to Earth. But certainly, I think there's a, a great recognition that there's a lot of opportunity for institute resourcing. How do we develop um, on the moon and then use that to propel us into deep space? There's, of course, the science. And Matt talked about the radio free zone on the, on the uh, far side of the moon, um, but also you know, many more studies to be done. And a lot of these missions that I see planned in the next five to 10 years are science-driven missions. They're to test regolith or bring lunar samples back to Earth. They are to test water ice in craters um, and to continue doing that kind of research and science and to build from there to the exploration and testing for deep space. Um, and so we see that really clearly with NASA's moon to Mars plan. It's not just a moon plan. Uh, it is how do we get to that back to the moon, test these systems, uh, life support, uh, robotics and then build forward to go on to Mars and that is that is the goal there um, certainly these these technological hurdles there are many to be overcome um, and you know we've we've talked about some of them already but I also think there's a there's a huge role here on national pride and prestige like in the United States we have such a history uh, because of the Apollo program that um, we, we often take for granted. And I was just uh, across the pond and, and over in the UK and, and kind of popping around Europe, I know, lucky me, um, talking to the different space agencies involved and the different actors involved like ESA and their motivations for, for joining Artemis um, and going back to the moon. And it's not the same as the United States. It's a lot more focused on international collaboration, on the science, and on the opportunities for partnerships and to spur their own industries to participate. And so I think, you know, varied across governments, but also in the states, certainly we can't leave without talking about the geopolitical competition with China. And Administrator Nelson, uh, spoke about this in his budget hearings in order to you know, make the case to Congress, which as a former uh, Congress person, he does very well, um, but of, of competing with China in this goal, Back to the Moon, which really feeds into this race dynamic as if there is you know, just one, uh, one goal or one mission, and, and yet I think there's just such a diversity of different motivations across the board that that's why for me this doesn't quite resonate as a space race. Yeah, so there's, 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 there's a complexity here that a, that a simple metaphor yeah. does not ca uh, capture, even if there's some elements of it that do fit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, Caitlin brought up the, the 
the other country that we're all probably thinking about and haven't actually named until Caitlin did, and, that, and that's China. So I have a, a the questions are coming in in the chat, and this is a, a, a comment here that says the um, the space race narrative is mainly promoted mainly by the U.S. Right, so Minister Nielsen, you know, some of the things that we see in the media, but this panel is, is an international panel, um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a good observation. So Richard, I'm going to put a question uh, here to you. Um, so, you know, here, much of the media and public conversation around lunar activities has this U.S.-China competition element to it. Um, you're interested uh, in, in the development of applications related to lunar activities, but you're not directly part of the U.S.-China bilateral dynamic, right? Um, so how much does this focus on the U.S.-China dynamic detract from a bigger picture that you might be seeing in terms of lunar activities? Well, uh, I, I think the, the perspective is, uh, you're right, I, I think a little different from uh, other nations. I mean, my, my sense from, from the UK is that there is less focus on that US-China uh, dynamic to do with, uh, with uh, lunar exploration. Um, and I, I think it, it is a bit distracting, uh, I think. The, um, in general, uh, you know, if, you, if you go looking for a fight, then you will find a fight. Uh, I think that's probably the position I would start from. And, um, and so posing it as a, an oppositional process, you will find opposition. Um, I, I think what, what, you know, what, would, what would a race look like? What does winning actually look like? Um, I think that, that's interesting to sort of ponder because the, uh, the definition of this race and what, what victory represents um, isn't, isn't really expressed. Um, you know, if... Um, if it is a race, uh, then I, I think, you know, we, if we must think of it as a race, then I, I think it's much better to consider it a, a, a happy, friendly uh, marathon uh, <laughs> rather than an, an angry sprint, uh, let's say. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we had what, what, in hindsight, you, you might characterize as something of an angry sprint uh, in the 1960s. Um, it burnt itself out in some respects. Obviously, it left a long legacy afterwards. Um, but I think second time around, I'd, I'd rather we had uh, you know, maybe a, a three-legged marathon uh, <laughs> rather than a, a sprint in that sense. Uh, and so then I think you, you start to turn it into a, a good news story rather than a bad news story. And, um, and, and, and okay, in that context, what does winning look like? Well, actually, I, I think winning starts to look like cooperation. You know, it actually starts to look like working together. The, the win scenario here is that the US and China resolve some of their differences and, um, and actually join forces in this respect. Um, and that becomes a win-win-win a, a situation in, in which both of those parties can be seen to have won. And actually... Everyone has won, not, not just the sort of two most prominent uh, participants. I think, um, yeah, from, take, take, uh, take this as a comment from a, from a Brit. Um, conquering new worlds doesn't always work out quite how you expect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, and, and on that note, um, wow, so, okay. Um, Quite, quite a lot there. I think um, I want to come, there's, there's a number of questions that have come in around this idea of cooperation. Um, so do, I do want to come back to that here and whether how that fits. Um, win, 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 three-legged sprint, uh, three-legged marathon, uh, beginning to think I need a track coach as part of my, my panels as well. But um, Richard, what you're getting at again is, is just this, the, maybe the, the, the simplification of a single race, you know, two-party race just does not fit. The, the environment, right? Um, yeah. From where you're seeing it, right? And so, uh, see if you kind of already hinted at some of the differences that, that you see um, from, from your, your perspective. So, is that true? What, what are these differences? And, you know, are we talking about a three legged marathon? Are we talking about a, you know, a, a relay, maybe even? I don't know. Um, well, I think there, there are absolutely, there are so many differences between the 60s and now. Uh, and I'm sure most of us know what those differences are. Um, but I, I will, you know, first of all, you know, we've already been to the moon. Whoever, it's not like somebody's, China will get there first. You know, that only changes the nature of what does a first actually mean. But second of all, um, there are 
um, so, you know, the barriers to entry in terms of lunar exploration are very different now, and so many other actors are involved in the process for whatever reason, whatever, whatever goals they may have, that it changes the nature of the whole ecology of what's going on. Um, and third, I think we know so much more about lunar and cislunar space and just generally about the moon than we did 50 years ago, which I think allows us, allows more actors to perhaps successfully do things that were much more difficult 50, 60 years ago. I do want to point out, uh, you know, I, to be a naysayer a little bit about that there are differences, and I think, uh, um, well, let me put it this way, there are things that haven't changed much in, in those 50 years. One is that uh, the moon is still the moon. It's still just as hard to get there. You know, it's not like things have changed and things have gotten easier in terms of the actual physicality of what's going on. We're still using basically liquid propellant propulsion chemical sources to get to the moon, which is also very old. Um, and most importantly, the actual imperative to get to the moon, nobody has successfully demonstrated or made a profit going to the moon, yet anyway. Now, of course, we envision somehow that may happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And so when people in the 60s were talking, there's lots and lots of enormous amount of studies in NASA and elsewhere about, oh, we're going to do, go do this, we're going to go get the minerals. We're gonna, you know, there's enormous amount of studies. That was 50, 60 years ago. So yet it hasn't happened now yet. And I think because this stuff is hard, and I think it, it means that this stuff will continue to be hard in the next decade, two decades. And I'll just say one more thing. One of, Apollo was a fantastic technological achievement, no, hands down, incredible. But I think in many ways it might have been the worst thing to happen to the American space program because it set the bar so high. Eight years from 1961 to 69 in the technology we had in the 60s, we're on the moon. Anything that happens after that, because we're always talking about the space, the space race and space moon race and so forth, is going to be, it's not going to match up. We need to let go of our nostalgia for Apollo and kind of move on and work with different models than the, the old 1960s race. So the, the, I've, I've heard some people refer to the Apollo hangover that has continued, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. So it's always looking back on that excellent singular achievement and, and the, the national you know, support behind it and the budgets that were behind it. And, yeah. yeah. And, and it's not going to happen, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Matthias, on, on, that, on that theme, um, you know, the race, you know, does, does, does this idea of a winner take all, get to the end, that's a race, does that drive sustainability? How does that relate to some of the um, programmatic, environmental, economic sustainability objectives that, that countries like Luxembourg are, are putting into policy? Yeah, clearly the, the winner takes it all is not really an option for us. And uh, probably for most it's not an option, even though if I play the devil's advocate, uh, dictatorship has its advantages, mm -hmm. let's say. But that's clearly not an option in the mm -hmm. geopolitical context we are in, and, and especially also for the developing part of the world, it's, it's, that, that will not work, it's obvious. So what we need is to be as inclusive as possible. We need international cooperation to solve all these challenges. In the end, for the benefits of all of us, both public and private entities can, can have a, uh, a share of the cake, let's say. And also both smaller countries like Luxembourg and larger ones, obviously. Now the, the question, of course, the interesting question is indeed what is sustainability in the context of, of, of cis lunar space, in lunar operations and even beyond. Um, and, and I think again we've seen how, how broad sustainability can be defined and in the end everything we discussed here over these two, two days can easily be exp expanded to the moon. So from our point of view I would maybe focus on, on three main aspects of sustainability. The first one is like political sustainability. We need obviously international frameworks that, that are able to organize all of this and, and even though we take the angle of looking at it through, through space resource utilization, by extension everything that is discussed for example at COPUOS on space resources has, is, is much broader in scope in the end and really concerns operations on the moon more broadly. And there is some progress there. You know? So even though COPOS with its 100 member states, more than 100 member states, is, is slow and it can be quite frustrating, in the end there is definitely some progress. If I look back like uh, past eight years when the topic of space resources started to be discussed at COPOS, these were extremely difficult discussions with lots of resistance. Now there's a 
a general feeling, even in the geopolitical context that we are in, that this is going to happen and that we need to find a solution. And I can tell you last, last week, uh, on the topic of space resources in Vienna, the, the discussions really took off, I would say, with, with first elements on what needs to be actually tackled. And there is some progress, even with difficult, uh, let's say, bilateral relationships between certain countries. So that's definitely uh, what I would say is a political sustainability that we need to ensure over the next uh, years. And I'm actually quite confident that this, this is feasible just because of practical reasons. And of course, there are other fora like the Artemis Accords, uh, but also ISEC-G, for example, that also help in, in, in building up this sustainability. Then second is uh, sustainability in an environmental uh, sense. So obviously everything we discussed here for low Earth orbit is also somehow by extension valid and for the moon. We need to ensure that we, we, we for example, with resources that we responsibly use these resources that we take in uh, um, circular economy and waste uh, re reduction and um, recycling concepts from the very start. I can give an example of what we did in Luxembourg together with the European Space Agency. We created the European Space Resource Innovation Center, which is supposed to be like a center in Europe dedicated to the use of space resources and the big, big uh, the topic we address there is the sustainability on how you, how you can do this. And there's a lot of, to learn from the terrestrial mining sector, actually. Of course, all these things have already been addressed on, on Earth. And what we all want is to avoid the errors that we made here, or some of the errors, and, and, and do it better on the moon. And then the third point, and that's especially important also for a country like Luxembourg, is economic sustainability. If we want to create this, um, this uh, commercial environment as well with companies that are also viable from a com commercial point of view, then we need to ensure this economic sustainability. Uh, we need to bring in uh, private investors and also give them the assurance that all of this can work. Yeah, yeah. But the good, good, good news is definitely that there is a, a broad positive uh, movement in the right direction here that's, that can clearly be seen. So. Matthias, I think you're, you're keying up on other things that, that's going to lead nicely into our, our next panel, which, which uh, looks at some of the space resources issues, specifically in the context of, of government governance agreements like Artemis Accords, the Moon Agreement, and, and, and that discussion. So kind of a good demonstration of how these, these issues kind of cross across different areas of, uh, of sustainability and of, 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 of governance discussions. Um, a couple of other things I want to pick up in those remarks, but I just want to give a chance to the, uh, any of the other panelists if you want to reflect on the idea of what is the relationship between a, 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 a mythology around the space race and you know, the sustainability objectives that in theory, we're all interested to hear um, in this audience. Richard, Caitlin. Yeah, please, I have yeah. a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, I've been, I've been talking with um, some folks at, at Princeton who were enlightening me about how cislunar orbits are incredibly complex and they're not as, um, as stable as you know, our near-Earth orbits. And so thinking about how do we dispose of debris in cislunar space. We don't have you know, that, uh, the Earth-like atmosphere that we can dispose of debris from LEO into. We can't burn things up. Um, obviously, I think I can speak for all of us in the room. We don't want to just crash those satellites into the moon constantly either, especially if we have people there. Um, but these, these cislunar orbits are also much more complex, and so we can't quite mimic the geo graveyard either. So how do we get out in front of, of these questions as we see 100-plus missions heading to the moon and thinking about sustainability of the cislunar environment the, and the moon and the lunar surface? Um, and starting to work through some of these really challenging issues that cross, you know, technical astrophysics as well as, as those of us who work in policy and international cooperation because, you know, like, like the, the norms that we are trying to envision for near-Earth space, uh, for disposal and proper behavior, we have to come at this from an international solution. Um, and perhaps we will have an easier time with a blank sheet of paper that is says lunar space or the moon. But you know, everything we do from space is, is because of, of you know, where we sit on Earth and the geopolitics on Earth will always extend into those conversations. Um, and so I think while 
the blank sheet of paper is, is a great uh, optimistic view. We will carry these biases along with us. And so the lack of communication and cooperation that we're seeing in neurospace um, on, on sustainability issues in SSA and STM uh, is, is quite challenging as we think about an even more complex environment. All right, thank you. So uh, about 20 minutes left, got a number of questions here. Um, and TSO only returns to something uh, actually that both you and Richard uh, have already kind of mentioned. Um, Matthias, you mentioned ISEC-G, that is the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Did I get that right? Um, right. There's, uh, I think, 28 or so countries that participate in that, including the US, including Russia, including China, including a number of emerging um, space nations, right? Um, so we have a few questions here about all right, let, let's, let's step past talking about the space race and, and realize that we've got this growing ecosystem, growing number of actors that are interested in the moon. Where are the opportunities for cooperation or, or collaboration in that? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm never going to the moon. I'm never going to operate a mission to the moon myself, but I am terrified of lunar dust, right? So what can we do to um, build interoperability in, into, into lunar plans, build safety into lunar plans. I'll just open that up to, to anyone um, on the panel. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. Well, I, I think if, perhaps if I uh, come in there, I mean, I think one of the, um, one of the things we, we can do, which I, I think is influenced by this, this perceived race dynamic, is, is, is actually try and just ensure that we... Um, we pursue decency in, in how we approach things. Um, you know, where, where we've got um, potential to leave debris behind uh, on the moon, um, or perhaps uh, you know, accidentally leave radioactive material um, splattered across an area of the moon or some such. Um, then, you know, in, in, in the kind of race mentality, perhaps, uh, perhaps you walk past the other guy's um, junk and say, well, that's not my junk, I'm leaving it there. Uh, but I, I think actually we, we've got to pursue a more sort of decency-based approach to, uh, to this in, uh, in how we proceed. So, um, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps the US astronaut does pick up the, uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, failed unit there, um, albeit with permission. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I, th I think we, uh, we have to try and get to a state where all parties view that as the right thing to do, uh, just, mm -hmm. just decency in the way that we operate. Could I just jump in real quick? Okay. Um, if, you know, in my mind, I envision the future of where there are perhaps two lunar bases. There's the Chinese-Russian lunar base that's planned. There's the American-led Artemis base. If those are the only humans on the moon and something happens, like that human instinct to help one another, I think is critical. And so if we can't cooperate on a government level and the Chinese, you know, lunar base is, it has a hub that our astronauts can get to safely if something were to happen. That kind of human first safety needs to happen. Um, and I think that is a great avenue for coordination and cooperation, but it's gonna start with basic communication, uh, which we heard from General Shaw is, is fairly limited between the United States and China. Um, the US kind of hampers itself with the Wolf Amendment and being able to, to communicate with China um, from a NASA standpoint. Um, but we need to break down some of these barriers in the case of, of those types of life or death situations that we can, um, you know, safely house one another or we can uh, communicate if, if there are certain lines of transportation between the Earth and the Moon that are um, more trafficked um, and, and more st stable or sustainable that we can actually have that coordination amongst nations who are active which, and companies which will be few at first, but you know, as we, we keep hearing, will eventually grow, or we hope that the economy will eventually grow there. But we have to start somewhere, and, and perhaps you know, science, safety, sustainability is where you start. Yeah. Right, and there's a if I may add on, on this, I think what, what is absolutely key is obviously that we discuss, and not only among member states, but also with private entities and mm -hmm. academia. And one very nice, in an interesting exercise that I had the pleasure to participate with Ian actually was the Hague Space Resource Governance Working Group 
which was an effort over four years where we really had this interaction between different actors. And one thing that was always coming up there, so the, the intention was to build up building blocks for future international framework for space resource utilization. And again, by extension, I think also operations on, on the moon. And one thing that always came up uh, was adapt the notion of, of adaptive governance, uh, saying that basically you cannot uh, govern everything from the start, you have to evolve uh, the framework depending on the actual need. Mm -hmm. I think that's also what's happening right now. Uh, for example, the realization that actually on the moon there are only a few spots that are really interesting to be on and to build your lunar base. So obviously even if you only have two players that go there, but I would add you of course have also private entities that want to go mm -hmm. to these spots. So there is a very quick realization that you need an international mechanism to coordinate these just these operations just for safety reasons. Also what we see is that now there are private entities really starting to go to the moon. We recently had iSpace uh, with, with the launch attempt. So also there, there's the realization, well, this is actually happening now, so we need to tackle it. So, mm -hmm. And again, there are some fora, of course, Corporos is like the, the big one, the, the very formal one, but there are so many other fora where these uh, things are discussed, bring really, really valuable building blocks for, for these future regulations. So again, yeah, the most important is that, that we have these discussions and actually a forum like this one is of course also a way to, to have these discussions. Yeah. So, so there are a number of questions here in the chat about deconfliction of activities um, in space resources, but also just in kind of other areas of, of lunar activity. I think uh, we may get a chance to get a little more into those in, into the next panel, but I just wanted to, to mention that. We also have a... Uh, Caitlin, you mentioned the Wolf Amendment. We have a question here about will the Wolf Amendment hamper efforts by the U.S. and China to deconflict uh, activities on the moon uh, on a purely bilateral basis? Yes, it, it probably would be a barrier to that, um, but I think the path to that is through some of the multinational forums that, that you know, um, Matthias, you're talking about, uh, uh, ISEC, G, COPUS, uh, others. So you know, the Wolf Amendment is a thing that we definitely have to deal with when we're talking about the U.S.-China dynamic, but it's not a full stop barrier, right? Um, uh, so we've got a, a few minutes. I'm gonna do what I like to do and, and ask a few very direct questions to a few individual uh, individual panelists here. Um, and so, um, where did it go? So Caitlin, the first one uh, I see is here for you. Um, from the 106 Sizzlinger uh, missions you, you researched, uh, are you seeing anything in there about end of life um, approaches and space debris mitigation or is it that level of detail not there? No, that level of detail is, is certainly not there. The trends that I'm seeing is the frequency, the timeline, the mission set, uh, whether that is um, ice water science um, or if it's building transportation and logistics, so building a way, you know, sustainable way for us to get there and back. Um, but there is not a lot of discussion on, on end of life. And, you know, maybe this does, is a, is a circumstance where it mimics how we were in the 60s, not quite thinking of it yet. We're just trying to get there. Um, but we know better now. And I think, you know, um, that's something that as we look at international and national frameworks for governing those actions to go back to the moon, you know, extending that um, requirement or initiative to have you know a good end of life plan could you know i think really change the dynamics there right. uh, so asif now uh, to you uh there's a narrative that the apollo program had massive public and political support true it didn't no um yeah. i mean it did it had support but it wasn't massive in terms of public support it did have massive congressional support uh, and uh, bipartisan until about 1966 or 67 when it peaked out the budgets. But in terms of popular support, we have st extensive studies now that suggest roughly about half the American population were, you know, supportive of Apollo. Um, you know, if you, it depends on the way the question was asked. Would you, you know, do you support Americans going to the moon? They would say, oh yeah, of course. Would you support Americans going to the moon if they spent X billion dollars? <laughs> then people start yeah, thinking yeah. about, well, yeah. uh, I don't know about that. So. Uh, I think as a core principle of exploration and space flight, I think Americans are generally positively dis predisposed to that. But when you sort of factor in budgets and things like that, people start to you know, think about it. I even though the, the percentage of the NASA budget as, as part of the overall budget is quite minuscule in, in terms of relative yeah. terms compared to many other things that we spend lots of money on. But I, I do think that um, 
yeah, I, I think that, I, and I think the climate is very different now because, well, you know, people are excited about a lot of different things, including private space. And, but I think ultimately NASA has a cultural value that is extremely hard to put money on. You know, you see kids wearing NASA shirts everywhere and that sort of thing. It's incredible uh, how that is a global brand in some ways, as, as much as a global brand as anything else. And I think it, it's when, when NASA does something, people pay attention, and that is a historical story. It's because it was set up in the 60s, and it's still with us today. Yes. Yep, so history, or uh, the, the, the mythology persists and, and, and yeah. build, builds up on itself in a way, yeah. right? And I, I do I definitely agree with you. you know, I, Fortunate to travel a fair bit, and the, the, the NASA logo, be it the worm or the meatball, is <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. It's amazing. Right? That's true. Um, all right. So, uh, Matthias, uh, I'm going to ask you this in a personal capacity. Um, can, can uh, the, given going back to the U.S. China dynamic and, and the, the limitations of the Wolf Amendment, can uh, Europe act as a, a mediator or an intermediary between U.S. and China to help us with some of this deconfliction? <laughs> Well, I, I, would, I, have, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly speaking, at the moment, uh, with the geopolitical context we are in, I have the feeling you have to choose sides, unfortunately. But uh, speaking for Luxembourg, definitely, at the moment at least, we don't have any issue with, with China, if I may so. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a lot of Chinese banks, Chinese entities in Luxembourg, and these relations uh, work. And so, indeed, I, I think in Europe, Overall, we have this willingness to, to be a sort of bridge, and I hope this will be maintained for, for a certain while, even though it, it seems to get harder, harder and harder. Yeah. Yeah. And I would point out from my idealistic NGO perspective that that bridge doesn't necessarily have to be direct, right? So if, if you're talking to China over here and you're talking to the US over here, that perspective can be shared even through that kind of indirect, yeah, yeah. Indir indirect link, right? Um, yeah. All right, uh, Richard, a similar, slightly unfair question to you uh, as well. So um, the, there's a question here that says, you know, China has a rate of innovation that is uh, perceived to be a lot faster than, than in, in the US or, or maybe other parts of, of, of the West, right? Um, your, 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 innovation, your, your organization is interested in, in innovation generally. Is there anything that we can learn from the Chinese system of innovation to, to apply? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess um, one of the key things that, you, that, that we always see is um, where, you've, where you've got a, a, a political environment where you can say, okay, we're all going left, um, then everyone goes left and, and things happen quickly. Um, you know, I mean, that's uh, <laughs> made earlier. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, let's say, one, one of the uh, benefits, if we can call it that, of, of, of dictatorship. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a characteristic that we, we saw in, uh, in the 1960s with, uh, with, with the Apollo program. So, you know, a, a clear direction. I mean, let, let, let's call it that rather than, uh, than dictatorship. But I, I think if you, have a, um, if you have a vision, you know, you, you have a particular... Uh, Objective in mind, and uh, and you are you know, focused on that, then then you you can make it happen. Um, uh, the, the, the sort of counter argument to that, I suppose, is that um, in pursuing that objective, you take your eye off other objectives. Uh, and I think that the plurality of, of what's going on at the moment around uh, around the uh, uh, approaches to what happens on the moon is is actually a strength. Um, you know, some of the things that are being uh, attempted. Will uh, will wither, uh, uh, or perhaps it's simply not their uh, their moment in time. Um, others will succeed, and it, you know it's it's always hard to spot the winners um, ahead of time. It's very easy to recognise the path in hindsight. All right, thank you. So, all right, this is going to go back now. Anybody is free to answer this. I'm not going to pick on any any one person. So. Um, let's accept. Let's say for the purpose of this question that this is a race. All right. Um, what can the leading countries do to help make sure everybody participates and gets across that finish line? How, how do we make this a beneficial activity, even if within the context of, of the, the small competitions that we see? I think from, from our perspective, at least, I, I'm not sure if we would qualify as a leading country here, but we definitely try to do our best to, to contribute. 
But uh, what is very key is to explain why you're doing this and, and also to explain to those countries that are not in the, in the race, in the marathon, <laughs> um, why it's actually interesting also for them. What are the actual benefits? And, and that's where you have to make the link between the cis-lunar and lunar developments with, that, with what happens on Earth and how it, all these things that we do on the moon in the end also benefit our life on Earth. That's absolutely key. And, and of course, there are some... Mm -hmm a lot of ideas on how you can bridge this. Of course, learning, for example, technology-wise from certain developments that you do for the moon that you then spin back to, to, to Earth and bring, bring to other industries, actually bringing in other, other countries from the very start, allowing them to participate, to, to build capabilities. And, that, and that's really what you need to also get the buy-in, in, especially in this international fora, for, for, this, uh, for this very futuristic plans or for, for what looks like futuristic plans to, to many of the other countries. I think, um, I, I, I think you, know, you can also take uh, positive characteristics from the, the nature of a race. Um, you know, here, here we are in, in the US, the, uh, the economy here is, is built on the principle of a race. You know, it, is, uh, it is woven into the fabric of the, uh, the capitalist sort of uh, system that you have competing organisations vying to do things in the best, uh, best way they can. W where that becomes destructive is, uh, is where you allow monopolies to, uh, to evolve out of that competition, and then that, that you know, negates the, uh, the competitive process. So, um, you know, the competition is, is, is a good thing, uh, if it's uh, if it's exercised in the right context, and uh, you know, av avoiding the, uh, the sort of a, the, the, the more aggressive aspects of that, uh, I think is the, uh, the the objective here. Let, let's keep a little bit of uh, friendly competition, um, but uh, but just manage it. I mean, I, to your question, Ian, I think the U.S.'s approach to the Artemis program is is exactly that. It's we're not going alone. We're going with friends and allies and and, and anyone who who wants to join, and, and we're often offering a ride, which is a huge expense and, a, you know, obviously a very technically challenging piece to even get to the moon, as we've seen. Um, and so NASA, um, by offering that as a service to other countries and companies who are joining up, are bringing along their friends. You know, I think about, as well, um, what my colleague said about, you know, there are just a couple places on the moon or in cislunar space that are more advantageous than others for science or resourcing or stability. Um, how do we keep these, you know, large but, but finite um, areas open for future countries, future missions, future um, uh, organizations who want to, to join in? And, and in space, I think of the ITU as kind of an analogous, like there is a finite resource of, of the geo belt and how we've started, uh, how the ITU has allocated spectrum across and, and allocated, um, you know, in a, in a system that includes non-spacefaring nations as well as, as the big spacefaring nations. And so how do we think about governance structures that protect that finite resource mm -hmm. on the moon or in cislunar space for future generations to come? And it's not a winner takes all. Um, whoever gets their first approach. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if we look at the planned landing sites for the Chinese uh, series of, of lunar missions and the Artemis program, mm -hmm. they look pretty darn similar, right? <laughs> which which in, a, in a context of competition, you go, well, that might be a bad thing. But then you look at the scientific realities, the technical realities, and it's maybe not that surprising that the landing sites are similar, right? So a theme we've heard in multiple panels here is the importance of transparency, the importance of communication, and I think we can add coordination here so that you know, these nations are going to pursue their scientific objective, they're going to pursue their national pride objective. We need a way to share information and, and have a little bit of, not necessarily a collaboration, but coordination. I know coordination is a topic that for learners has come up at Copios in a couple of senses. So uh, we've got about two minutes left. Um, so I want to really quickly uh, ask a, a yes, no answer here before giving the wrap-up question. Um, the, the, if the first space race was to the moon, shouldn't we be talking about the next space race being to Mars? Yes or no? <laughs> it's a trick question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, sure, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree as well. All right, so it's not a lunar space race, folks. It's a Martian space race. All right. Uh, really quickly, to, to just wrap this up, um, as this audience walks out of the room, what do you want them to be thinking about as what, in your viewpoint, is the actual key drivers of this wave of interest in instance lunar um, activity? Just anybody go down the line and start. Sure. Uh, I mean, the drivers, I think, are varied. No. Um, with different interests from different parties, and we're going not just as whole of world, but um, as all people and, and different companies and, and countries, and um, to create this sustainable future, both environmentally but also economically, and all of the reasons that Matthias announced earlier is uh, we really have to work together internationally, which, as we know, is very hard. But I think we have a bit of a head start, and maybe the urgency um, displayed by the the traffic and the potential for SIDS lunar space in the moon and just the kind of excitement and, and imagination that it inspires will help push us forward. And that is a very optimistic perspective, but I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> for us, I would say the key driver is really showing how, how all of this benefits mm -hmm. us and, and what is really the socioeconomic benefits of doing this. Of course, there's a lot of inspiration, science, exploration that, that's clear. And that is a, a big drive. <coughs> but if we really want to develop an in-space uh, and cis-lunar economy, we need to go beyond that and really work on, on business cases, on future markets, on, on actual business cases that make sense also for us and, and, and bring benefits to a much wider uh, community. Yeah. I think uh, just, just as we inherit insanity from our children, um, I, I think... Uh, we, uh, we, we inherit the moon from, from our great grandkids. Uh, and so I, I think we, we just need to go about this whole process in, in a way that uh, our, our grandkids <coughs> would, be, would look back on and, uh, and approve of. Yeah. Um, I think these are exciting times. Um, they're a bit scary too, but I, I do think that all this talk of sustainability is encouraging and hopeful, so that's all I'll say. All right, all right well, thank you to the panels. Thank you to the audience. Um, thank you.